And I'm really pleased that we're being joined by Simon Mahoney, Emeritus Professor of Digital Humanities at UCL, um, always a really engaging and interesting speaker on this particular topic, and someone else who's been working within digital humanities, um, also formerly at UCL, but now at the University of Shanghai, Dr. Yaming Fu. Um, and they're going to be talking to us about how we really look at embedding equality, diversity, and inclusion in those glam structures that we have with digital storytelling. So without further ado, I am going to pass over to Simon. Simon, if you'd like to join us on screen and look forward to hearing more. Um, thank you very much for a very kind uh, introduction. It's my great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, and I have to say that I've learned a great deal by reading the Research London um, sorry, the Research Library UK's publications on um, equality, diversity and inclusion. And when I first started work in this area, Christina was the first person I contacted for information. Um, just to introduce um, a project or a topic today, I need to make clear that this is a digital humanities project. So like all projects, it's a subject as teamwork. It's uh, certainly not my project alone. It really comes out of the research from the Digital Humanities Group at uh, Shanghai Library. And this is main, what you're going to hear today is really my colleague's work, um, Yaming Fu, rather than mine. It's Yaming's work with my support rather than the other way around. As it says on the slides here, we've got her, her name first. Um, Yaming may be familiar to some of you because she did her PhD in Department of Information Studies at UCL and in the Libraries program. So she's very, very much a Libraries person. Um, she did her postdoc at, uh, with my friends at Shanghai Library, which is um, how we got involved in this. Um, Yaming and myself have been working together for several years on small projects. And um, uh, this one today is, um, I guess, our latest piece on it. We have some publications that you can find um, online, and we have several talks that you can find details about those. But this presentation is very much um, Yamings, and you may know her as Cindy. So if I refer to Cindy, you know who I'm talking about. It's uh, Dr. Yaming Fu. So Cindy, unfortunately, cannot be with us today because um, she's currently in, in Shanghai and there's a large time difference. But that's not the real reason. The real reason is she's on a residential training course and like can't get away and join us. Hello, everyone. My name is Yaming Fu. I'm a lecturer at School of Cultural Heritage and Information Management at Shanghai University. And today uh, it is a great pleasure to join the seminar on inclusive collections, inclusive libraries that is held by Research Libraries UK. And um, I'm here to present on behalf of Professor Simon Mahoney, who's um, online here, and uh, also the whole DH team at Shanghai Library. And today our topic is about embedding equality, diversity, and inclusion in glam structures with digital storytelling. And my talk today uh, will be divided into three parts. Firstly, I will talk about the background of this project, uh, include um, the EDI issue in GLAM institutions, and also talk about the research method of digital storytelling and its relation to the participatory term in GLAM institutions. And the main part of today's talk will be our case study at Shanghai Library, which is the Shanghai Cultural Collection Project. And I will talk about the methodological framework of uh, using BS in promoting EDI. And in the summary part, I will talk about how DS has supported uh, the EDI issue in GLAM structures and also some of our expectations and um, experiences uh, during this project. Um, so about EDI in GLAM institutions, we know that it has been included in many institutional strategies by uh, many GLAM institutions around the world. Um, however, it is um, still in a very early stage 
in China, and not many GLAM institutions uh, has put EDI as its priority strategy in the institutional level. And um, well, GLAM institutions, we know that it is a commons which governs and manages cultural heritage and diverse forms of uh, historical and cultural collections. And, um, you know, during the GLAM institutions, uh, there are many professions, experts, researchers, supporters, audiences, and all kinds of social groups work together under its governance. So uh, the diverse forms of cultural heritage resources and the multiple stakeholders that take interests in and the responsibility of public education drive GLAM institutions to find ways to promote equality, equity, inclusion, accessibility, uh, et cetera, in all its uh, activities. Well, from the report by the GLAM diversity subgroup of the Digital Library uh, Federation, GLAMs and their uh, parent organizations are perceived as engaging in a very limited set of diversity, e equity, and inclusion activities. And specifically here, uh, they put collection highlights, public events or programs, and optional employee training and professional development. During our uh, relationship or collaboration with uh, Shanghai Library, so before we have been focusing on using digital storytelling in the library context to involve audiences in the understanding and interpreting historical and cultural resources. Um, so, uh, well, during our research, we started to, you know, notice that there is actually a connection between digital storytelling and the promotion of EDI. Uh, well, from its definition, you can see that digital storytelling, it is defined as a method for creating, expressing, interpreting, and sharing stories and personal experiences using digital tools, which means everyone uh, apart from curators has a way to express their feelings and sharing their uh, stories with the support of digital technologies. And it is therefore seen as a democratization of culture. So why is digital storytelling important for promoting EDI? Well, firstly, we think it is a good way to communicate ideas because good stories can break down barriers and make complicated concepts accessible to everyone. And uh, secondly, effective stories inspire people by creating human connections and emotional resonance. And thirdly, we think storytelling is not just about the present. It helps us understand and preserve the diverse cultural heritage and experiences of different communities communities. So that's why we think digital storytelling can be a powerful tool for promoting EDI by making complex ideas understandable to all and inspiring connections and preserving diverse memories and cultures. Um, so when we do the research, we found actually there has been studies about using DS uh, digital storytelling uh, in promoting EDI issue. So for example, uh, it is seen as a powerful tool for exploring and experiencing the collective identity of religious people or groups. And this helps in fostering understanding and uh, respect for diverse religious practice and beliefs. It can also be used to provide services and support for disabled people. By sharing disabled people's stories, individuals can highlight their experiences, challenges, and achievements, and thereby promoting inclusion and accessibility. So now let's move on to the case study at Shanghai Library. Our research uses Shanghai Library as a case study and builds on the ongoing digital humanities project, uh, which is called Shanghai Cultural Collections. It is an online platform with various forms of historical collections of Shanghai city, including archives, documentation, old photos, old magazines, maps, uh, newspapers, and motion pictures. 
So based on the collections, we construct a framework to include voices from diverse social groups that are usually silent. And we hope to collect the, their stories, experiences, and memories about the collections and the Shanghai city by digital storytelling, which is uh, we uh, which we used on a UGI, so user generated content function, a web a web page that is connected to this platform to enrich the presentation of the whole uh, collections about Shanghai city. So here comes the methodological framework that we used in the project. The digital means. Um, we uh, we used in the platform bring not only the simple enrichment of formats for expression, but also facilitate structural cha uh, change and an evolution of the production, precising and disseminating of the historical narrative. And the framework we used in our project contains five stages a comprehensive approach to enrich the way these institutions can engage with their collections and audience. So firstly, the first, the very first step of this framework is about a raw memory. So using existing collections of pictures um, uh, and relevant knowledge to arouse the audience memory about the Shanghai city. And the existing collections are used to trigger their memories and to connect individuals with their past. This step is very crucial as it lays the groundwork for a deeper emotional and historical connection between the audience and the collections. And the process emphasizes the inclusion of diverse participants, actively seeking to involve groups that are often underrepresented or marginalized, such as the elderly, the women, the young people, and by including a broad spectrum of voices, the stories become richer and more reflective of the entire community's experiences. And then you can see that uh, the, the stage comes to the creation of digital story uh, stories. Here, oral storytelling is enhanced with multimedia elements like photos, videos, short clips, or audio inputs as the audience wish. So social media platforms are also leveraged to broaden the reach and impact uh, of, this, uh, of these stories created by the audience themselves. And this multimedia approach not only makes the stories more engaging, but also more accessible to a wider audience. And once these stories are created, the next step involves interpreting those stories. So this involves a deep analysis to uncover hidden meanings and memories that may not be immediately apparent. Well, we know that although uh, we, uh, you know, for, for one picture, everyone has its own interpretation. So that's why this step is very important. <clears throat> because um, uh, by doing so, the stories gain additional layers of significance and providing more profound insights and fostering a greater understanding of the historical and cultural context. And the final step is the enrichment of collections. The multimedia stories created by users enrich the collections with diverse views and perspectives. And these insights and perspectives are integrated back into the collections themselves, enhancing the whole presentation of our collections. So by applying this whole framework, digital storytelling in GLAM, GLAM institutions not only revitalize the collections, but also ensures that the stories told are inclusive, engaging, and deeply meaningful to everyone. And by leveraging digital technologies and emphasizing diverse participation, GLAM institutions can create a dynamic and interactive environment that fosters a deep connection between the past and the present and ensuring that the stories and memories they preserve are accessible and relevant to all its members and community. So um, at the so by uh, this methodological framework, uh, what we again uh, or what we get from this project is that 
we indeed promoted the equality, diversity, and the inclusion issue in the library. So firstly, about the equality part, the digital stories can be more easily shared and accessed than traditional digital collections. By leveraging the online platform, uh, the audience can reach, uh, uh, you know, firstly, the digital resources can reach uh, more audience and underrepresented communities who may not have easy access to physical libraries or exhibitions. And uh, the whole online platform also gives more easy access to the audience uh, who can use their own uh, phone, who can use their own device like uh, their phone or their laptop to upload their memories and materials about the Shanghai city. And secondly, the personal about the personal engagement. By focusing on personal and community stories, digital storytelling democratizes the archival process. It values individuals' contribution and ensures that everyone has the opportunity to share their experiences, fostering a sense of belonging and ownership. And uh, in relation to diversity part, uh, so by actively including minorities and marginalized groups in the storytelling process, GLAM institutions can ensure that a wide range of perspectives are uh, represented, and this diversity enriches the narrative and broadens the understanding of history and culture. And also, by using uh, multi multiple formats of media, it makes it easier to uh, for the audience to tell their own stories that resonate with different cultural background and personal preferences. And this adaptability helps uh, helps to reach a wider audience and ensure that diverse ways of expression are respected and included. And uh, as for the inclusion part, the involvement in the creation and interpretation of digital stories ensures that the process is inclusive. And this participatory approach empowers individuals and communities, giving them some control in how their histories are recorded and represented. And um, so by reflecting marginalized narratives, we mean that by interpreting and integrating hidden meanings and previously unrecognized memories into those original collections, it helps to rectify histor historical imbalance and ensures a more inclusive historical record that is for, for all. And so uh, here comes to the last part, which is about our expectations. Although that we really hope that we can um, encourage more audience to uh, participate in the project and to uh, share their own stories about the Shanghai uh, city. Um, well, currently the audience who participated in the project is still very, very limited. But uh, we think that uh, although there is a long way to go, we will continue encourage all the citizens um, and all uh, all like diverse groups of people to participate in this process and share their own stories, um, because well, you know that with digital storytelling in the embedded in the structure of GLAM institutions presentation of its collections, uh, we see that it indeed promoted EDI by including the public's generation of stories, memories, and um, their very real feelings to the collections. And also we hope that all the audience can construct their own history to express their experience and memories about the city and also to enable them to reevaluate their understanding and uh, engagement with the collections and to raise uh, awareness of the need for inclusivity and engagement with the wider community. Um, so in the end, the framework we used uh, uh, aims to raise awareness of the need for inclusivity and engagement and remove barriers to inclusion and will go some way to remove the bias and implicit inequality that is often found in GLAM institutions 
particularly in areas with a significant post-colonial legacy. So that's the end of my talk today. And here uh, are the references list, uh, which you can refer to uh, if you are interested uh, at the uh, in the end. And I also put the link of the Shanghai Memory website here. Uh, uh, we'll welcome everyone to click into it and to explore uh, the Shanghai city and its history. And um, uh, it is, unfortunately, it is in Chinese language right now. And right now, we really hope that we can have more uh, stuff who's capable of you know, doing multiple languages. And we hope that in the next stage, we can build a website with multiple languages to choose. And also uh, you can find the context of me and Simon, Professor Simon Mahoney here. Uh, that's all of our presentation today. Thank you all for listening. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you, um, Simon, for being here to answer sort of more questions. Um, I think one of the things I was really struck by, you mentioned that this was a multi-year project. Um, and again, Dr. Fu also touched on the sort of challenge of getting different communities engaged and to participate with the online activities. Um, could you talk about that a bit more? How did you go about getting those communities to be aware of the project and then kind of really start contributing? What methodologies did you use? Uh, methodologies are fairly straightforward and fairly standard. Um, the, the plan was to run focus groups to recruit people from, uh, say this is a library project, and the library has a, a, a user base, a database of all the users, and to contact them and to put uh, publicity posters and flyers up in the library and to attempt to recruit people in that way. Um, unfortunately, uh, the timing was not too good because this project started in 2019 and we only actually ran one focus group and one tour. We were doing walking tours. Just to be clear, the, the original focus, and you may have seen the slide with a map and a little um, bar on there, and at the bottom, it's a journey from Wukang Road. The Wukang Road is probably one of the most famous roads in um, in Shanghai. It's in the French Concession, and it's a road where um, many, many famous uh, people, movie stars, uh, politicians used to live. And um, we were doing organizing walking tours, taking people down there and getting comments uh, from the people and participants then. Uh, that all had to be um, put on hold when the pandemic came and then one of the difficult difficulties I think with any ongoing project is keeping people engaged with it because the staff that are involved in this are actually going on for different projects for instance Yaming is now in uh, she was working in Shanghai Library then now she's in Shanghai University so she tries to fit this in with her day job and we are still we still have two papers in in, in progress to to develop these themes but they have the user generated content section of that web page so we're using the the online um and also the you know the physical you know recruiting people through posters and through emails sorry um we chat group or email sorry what am i thinking of talking about china yep. uh, nobody yeah nobody uses email because it's wechat okay and again, one of the questions we've had here is, you know, who from the community has participated and engaged so far? So if you could touch on that a bit. And then we've got a question about resources I'll come back to. Yeah, the, the, the community that we're, we're at, attempting to um, to uh, to engage here uh, were initially people who had um, either lived on or had a connection with Wukang Road and also the French concession in that area. French concession is a huge, great big chunk out of out of Shanghai. Um, one of the one of several European concessions there. And one of the one of the things that we find is that what we're looking for is we're looking for what we would call indigenous Shanghai people. Okay, let me just clarify what I mean by that. And that's speakers of Shanghainese. Shanghainese is a local dialect. 
and it's it's a little bit like Welsh and English. If you go to Welsh, you go to Wales, you go into a shop, they will address you in Welsh to see if you respond in Welsh, right? When you when you go, oh, I'll give them a blank look, then they talk to you in English. Shanghai News is, is fairly similar in the sense that um, that um, the the original population would you know have the Shanghai Shanghainese dialect. And when we started this research, I just thought it was the older people, you know, hanging on to the, the past. Absolutely not so. Um, it's marked up as one of the endangered languages, and it's it's very, very much um, also the remit of the younger people in Shanghai. So these are the people that we're attempting um, to to recruit. And the if you if you saw again on that page, there were two audio bars for the dialogue that accompanies the the image above it or the building that you click on there and the top one is in mandarin and the second one there is in shanghainese you know shanghai dialect and that's one of the things that we're trying to capture the voice of the local people because they are protective as everyone is if you're familiar with 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 shanghai it's it's in two halves it's separated by the river on the east you've got budong and the west you've got pusi right we see it's the original Shanghai. Pudong is like a new town. You know, nothing was there before 25 years. But that's where the financial district is, the huge shopping malls, Disney, what Disneyland, whatever, like Disneyland or Disney World, whatever it is. That's all over there. That's the new part. Um, it, the old part, if we see, is this is like the, the home, if you like, of the Shanghai people. And this includes the, the various concessions, the European concession, the French concession, and um, all the um, all the colonial legacy that's attached to that as well. And again, as you're sort of talking then, again, one of the questions that's just popped here is around about that these types of communities can be really distrustful of more official institutions <laughs> such as libraries and museums. Um, so was that an issue for, I mean, again, just thinking about the timing of the project, but you say it's continued onwards. So, you know, has that been an issue and have you had barriers there that you've overcome and if so how i think that's an extremely good point we're looking at trust uh cindy and i in other aspects when we're looking at ai and trying to leverage ai and you know the issues that, that we have with trust and, and yes whenever you what okay i'm an outsider so i really can't do this i have to rely on the people in shanghai library to do this because i'm clearly an outsider and most of those are outsiders. They're not native Shanghai people. So that's an extremely good question. I'm sorry, I don't really don't have a <laughs> legitimate answer for, but I, I'm sure the folks in the library do. Um, there must be, you know, native Shang indigenous Shanghai people that, that actually work there, that are youth. Because, again, it's, I, I, it's the same with any type of oral history. I mean, this is sort of very, very similar that, that you need to build up that rapport and you need to build that, that, that trust. And I'm involved in another project, which is very much oral history, um, in something completely different also in China. And it is the fact that the researcher who's leading the project can speak to them in their own local yeah. dialect. And that brings the trust up. So I think having the Shanghainese language included in the I hope would go some way to, to, towards that. And the leaders of the, um, the the focus groups and things like that, I, I very much hope that they're conducted in Shanghainese. It is really interesting that many of the local people there speak. I've been out with friends, Chinese friends uh, in that area. And she says, well, they're talking to me in Shanghainese. <laughs> and, and it is this way of, creating that identity and it's having that shared identity I, I think that builds the trust so you need some sort of balance I think um, in that area but that, yeah that's a really really good point on that yeah and again thinking about that balance because obviously this content is then joining content that sits within mm -hmm. a sort of library and archive so one of the other sort of challenges we quite often have as institutions around about you know are these stories are these histories you know what is the truth within them? Do we, you know, how do we check the facts within these and how do we then present that um, 
to a wider audience when we're putting it online. And I was wondering, as part of the project, did you look at that particular element? Yeah, this is this is part of the library um, rather than mine. Um, my focus on this was actually the project specifically on on Wukang Road, and um, the uh, the digital storytelling that went with that. And we've been combining that with the EDI um, element. But um, sorry, something just gone out of my head. Um, can you go back to the original? I had it. It was, and I just it was around it. that first and checking the sort of fact yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. collection. The, the the thing is the 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 collections that they have in the um, Shanghai um, cultural collections that um, Cindy pointed to, these are very very much mediated by uh, politics and ideology and specifically um, of the colonial legacy. Um, Shanghai's had a diverse past with the Europeans, and then you know, the Japanese occupation, invasion, occupation, and you have all those different competing elements in there. So this is one of the points of trying to capture the indigenous voices, the people that have a connection and, and to think about well, what's the point of the stories. Um, and I was giving a talk on storytelling um, at a different institution earlier this year. And, and I'm asking my audience, well, what's the story and what's the point of the story you know the stories that our parents tell us the stories that our grandparents tell us you know we don't task them with um, um historical accuracy or historical fact it's their interpretation of it and it gives us that sort of sense of connection and to an extent this whole thing about bringing in the the, the local community it is attempting to to, to bring a community element in it for the shared stories and shared histories. Okay, maybe some of them are at divergence, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but but the shared the shared sense of community around the history um, of Shanghai, which is completely different to the official record. I mean, that's that was the the original prompting by the uh, Professor Lu, who's not included in this one, but he's on the publication. Um, originally, his his point his point of view is is having something in opposition to the the record that they have, which is newspapers, you know, movies, photographs, and these are very very much the voices of the elite, and they're very very much they're very very biased in many many different ways, which you know you know completely about. So it's getting something to sort of balance that if we can try to get the voices of the people in there yes. this is to try to get the balance i think sometimes you need a multitude of voices about one event that allows you to sort of mm. shape up and, and get a deeper understanding of it and have you ever had any issues around about content that's been posted where you thought oh that's not something we can have you know on we need to maybe remove that or, or rethink that kind of particular contribution not not that i'm aware of um no. But it, but it, it would be in 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 Shanghainese, so I wouldn't be able to <laughs> read it. But, but um, sorry, obvious one. But um, the the other thing is um, to include photos. I mean, we're using this as uh, very very multimedia, so we try to include all voices if we can. But we also ask for you know photographs, family photographs, and and this is the point. One of the points that Cindy was making. I think that when we show a photograph, it triggers hopefully a memory. Um, the same same as we find in many glam institutions, if you put a photograph up there and people will recognize, they will recognize some of the content, they recognize the area, maybe they recognize the people, they can put a name to it, I don't know. But these types of uh, ways of engaging the, the local people and to, to try to trigger those episodic memories um, that they would have and encourage them to share them. And as I say, they, they may be divergent memories. Right? And again, with that sort of arousing memories and trying to get people to sort of share their stories, were there any particular 
types of material, um, archival material, or photo, you know, what in particular triggered memories? Was it mainly photographs that were most successful or were there other elements used as well? I think I think it's the photographs. I think they will be more. Um, another really, really interesting one is the newspaper archive that they have. And that, again, is, is, is very, very uh, politically biased. Um, depending on the time <laughs> what they were produced. But you've got various conflicting, you know, you've got pre-1945, you've got the establishment of the PRC in 1948, and then everything changes then. And um, or just sticking with, my, with the introduction of the PRC, this is when Mandarin became the official language, you know, in a, in a, in a way to unite the entire country with a single language. Uh, and this is when um, Shanghainese and all um, um, other dialects um, started to become protected by the local people and I, I had a conversation the other day with somebody and we were talking about Chinese cuisine and I said you have to remember when you're talking about China the size and the different provinces and it's like talking about European cuisine no 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 there's French there's Italian there's Spanish there's British right it's exactly the same in China. You know, there's Guangdong, there's um, uh, Sudong, there's Hunan, Henan, and um, uh, Chengdu. All these ones have different types of cuisines, and they all have different types of languages, sorry, different dialects, and they all have different cultural histories and stories. But, but sticking with Shanghai, they have their particular one. You know, you go, you find a, a, a Shanghai restaurant, but then there's also all the other varieties of cuisine, exactly the same as you get the other varieties of languages. If I can uh, tell you another little story on that, if you'll forgive me, but I, I, I'm, no, sure. when I stay, I'm often a guest at the at the library. The library still has some guest rooms at the back. And it's right on the edge of the French concession. And uh, they have a Starbucks in there that I try to avoid. But opposite the road, there's a little cafe, and it's called Cafe with a, a acute Caspar. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And next door to that is a Jamaica Blue. But the Wi-Fi is still linked to the original La Pen French. So you've got two places there with a French uh, name still on them. And the restaurant next door, I went in there with my friend, and I'm clearly a European. I go in there and the guy addresses me in French. And then when I don't reply, he addresses me in, in, in English. And he addresses my friend in Shanghainese and then Mandarin, right? So you have this very, very close proximity and very, very mix of these different cultural elements. And five minutes walk the other way, there's a series of Japanese restaurants and a Japanese bar, which I, I find, um, again, interesting. But these are all, you know, um, colonial legacy aspects, you know, the French, the Japanese. The British, think... the British are over down the Bund. They're the other end. Right? <laughs> they're too far down. They're, they're down by the river. The Bund, the Bund are down by the river. Yeah. But that brings me to another interesting um, question that's just been asked here, because you're sort of talking about all these different these different cultures, this kind of real mixing and melting pot. So obviously, some of the stories must have been fascinating coming out of the project. How do you go about analysing those stories? And I think that was one aspect I was particularly interested in the framework. It's not just the sort of gathering um, of these kind of oral histories and this added content to add to the library and the archival collections, but it's the fact that you're you're analysing and, and doing sort of further work to bring out that hidden meaning. So can you talk about that a little bit more? Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak Mandarin. <laughs> it's, 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 honestly, it's beyond me. Um, uh, this, this is a shame that Cindy's not here with us because she will be able to address this um, uh, much more clearly than a feeble attempt from me. But um, I have to say, you know, not that I'm particularly aware of. Nothing's come back at me saying, uh, watch out for this or watch out for that. Again, going back to your early question about things that, you know, we don't want to include. But as far as I'm aware, the more different voices and stories we can get in there, the better. And the more photos we can get people to upload, the, the better as well. And this sort of buys in, if you like, to Shanghai identity as well. I, I feel, uh, as a Londoner, right, that London, my identity is as a Londoner. 
and that's how I identify myself. And I think with people who identify themselves as Shanghainese, Shang indigenous Shanghai people, you've got to remember Shanghai, most of the population of Shanghai are, are outsiders. They call them outsiders. They're people that have come in from, with the growth of Shanghai from, from outside. So I think maintaining the, the, the Shanghai mess, the Shanghai language, I think is important. But, but also it's the stories that go back you know, if you've if your family have lived in in Shanghai for generations, then you've got those stories from your parents and your grandparents and, and things like that. And you know, they must have had the the young Chinese people growing up native to Shanghai, Shanghai today, will have grown up with stories from their grandparents about the uh, Japanese occupation, the formation of the PRC, the Maoist years, the Cultural Revolution, and all these sorts of things. And how that impacted on on Shanghai and their identity as Shanghai people, and and I guess their lives. Okay. I, but I can't I can't access that. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. just thinking around about what you were sort of talking about there, there's also that element of adding to the kind of collections that the library mm. already holds, and I wondered. We had a sort of question about the resources that the project required, and also how this kind of content is then adding to the collections. Can you talk a bit more about, you know, what was the resource of the project um, and how is it being sustained longer term? Sustained longer term is, is slightly easier because they've got a they've got an ex extensive um, project now. Um, if I can say it's changed, as Cindy mentioned, the Shanghai Cultural Collections it used to be called something else. It used to be called Shanghai Library Knowledge Bases, and they had very, very separate ones. Now they're all amalgamated into one. And by the way, the link that she gave at the end, although she apologised, it's all in Chinese, my browser translates it absolutely fine. And you can actually go into it. If you have a, a you know, a, a, a Google Chrome or something uh, with mm -hmm. translation set up, it will translate all the way down the different levels. And uh, the idea is to incorporate um, uh, the images in the, in the there's, there's one specific one for images, there's one for newspapers, there's one for all different things, and to include the material that's collected in a, in a, in a, in a place in there that you can sort of click down the, the drop down menu, you can, you can find them in there. And uh, now you mention it, I must go and I should be able to read them, right? <laughs> um, with, the, with the translation software. Um, I've actually not done that to to my to my regret, but now you've mentioned it, I think I will go and have a poke around in it. But it draws them all together. That's the one thing. And the other thing is that it is all freely available. Right at the bottom, it says copyright to the library, but you can freely they they are happy for you to download and take anything. One of the great things about the library is they really do adhere to the uh, whole open agenda the whole open access and all their material is 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 freely available uh, for download and have they had to use specialist software um and devise it for this project or have they just been able to utilize you know systems that they already had and were there additional staff needed or is it now part of the work that the staff are already doing it's part of the it's part of the ongoing project of maintaining the collections there was an earlier paper, it was published, I think, 2020. Um, and it's, again, it's got Wukang Road in the title. I remember helping, it doesn't have my name on it, you won't find it. But I, I remember um, editing drafts uh, for them before it was uh, before it was finally submitted. And, and that has a uh, in-depth description from the developer, uh, Professor Shah, who was, um, um, setting up all the systems to actually make everything work and um uh, she's moving on soon but I, I think she still has oversight and had the responsibility of bringing them all together but but um what they've done there what they've done is really remarkable achievement um for for a library in china i'm not aware i i have to say that attention has been diverted because they have the wonderful new uh, Shanghai East Library in Pudong, which is an amazing building with amazing systems in there. And I know that's diverted an awful lot of their attention to the setting up of, of that one. Um, for example, I'm lucky to catch the bus guy for coffee these days. 
whereas it used to be lunch and dinner every time I visited, you know. Um, and the developers have been working on the AI systems and the other things that are integrated into the new library there. So I'm not sure that there's much ongoing with right. the collections. I think they got the Shanghai Collected Collections rolled out. And Shanghai Memory is a part is a part of that. Yeah. Um, our EDI thing is part of the Shanghai Memory, so it sort of goes down that way. I've just had another question in around about, you know, how often are these stories accessed? Do you have any knowledge of what the statistics are like on that? And also, has the project led to more use of the archival collections there? Uh, I don't have that information. Again, I, I really, I, I can't, because I'm not, um, I don't work in the library and I don't, um, I, I'm not part of the um, the archivist there. I'm really, really an outsider. Um, and I help with the writing and the publications and the promotion of the work that we do. Um, they will have that information. That information is findable, right? And um, I'm sure we could ask somebody if if they want if they, if somebody particularly wants it, then then I'm sure I can retrieve it. But I really don't I don't have access to that that data. I'm afraid. No. Uh, but I am I am optimistic that it is used, and I'm optimistic about the amount um, of, of engagement. But I can't quantify it. Sorry. And just finally, one one of the other questions that's just popped up is, were there any particular items from the archives or libraries that were used with the focus groups very early on when you were doing those walking tours? Was it just the mm. photographs of the places or was mm. there anything else? Yeah, it was it was combined with the history. The, the walking tours specifically Wukang Road. And this was when we were doing the Journey from Wukang Road project that I was helping on. And I also extended that with some background history with uh, with Fu Yaming. Um, so there is a combination down there within that knowledge base, or what used to be called the knowledge base, which is now the, the, the Wukang Road project, sorry, Wukang, whatever it said on the slide, I sort of can't remember, they keep changing it, right? Um, is you've got the data and information about the specific houses so as you take the walking tour down there, this is this is a house that was lived in by such and such and such and such and such and such. And then you have the, the photographs of them. And then you also have what they're famous for, their works, if it's artistic, if they make movies, that link on with all these. So all these sort of things link together because their knowledge bases were in, integrated and you know all, all sort of linked open data stuff. Uh, they all sort of speak to each other. Um, if you go into that, that that web page um you can actually click on it and for every one of the buttons the houses you sort of click on you get those options that come up and you can find out all the information on there so yes the idea is you use that on your tablet or your phone as you're walking down the road then you can download it all right and get all the information about the individual houses um, one of the things that amazes me i've been down there I think when I was there last year, I wanted to, to take a load of my own photos. So I went on a quiet day. Normally, there's no such thing as a quiet day down Wukang Road. It is full of people. Don't go there at the weekend. Taking selfies and having like wedding photos taken outside houses. Honestly, I don't get it. But apparently, um, the people that were living there were really, really famous. And people like to have photos taken outside the houses of the famous people. Um, yeah. And it's never, never quiet there. But yes, so on the walking tour, you've got all the information coming from the uh, the mobile mobile app that you can use, giving you all the historical data. So, so the other thing is that also, as well as the people that live there, the buildings themselves have their own history. And there's another one that focuses on the history of the building, the architecture, uh, the style. Most of them are European style. Um, buildings along there, big walls outside to keep people out. No, and I think you've just really nicely encapsulated why linked open data is just... Oh, gosh, yeah. Yes, an amazing kind of element when you're sort of doing these projects that can really sort of bring different things together and, and really sort of highlight all those different aspects. Um, I'm happy to say that we've come to the end of all our questions now. So thanks very oh, much okay. to the audience. That's been absolutely fantastic. And 
Please, could you extend our sincere thanks to Dr. Yaming Fu? That's been an absolutely brilliant presentation and really sort of brought up lots of questions and things for us to think about, and also fantastic resource for us to explore and consider how we do sort of similar things within our context as well. So thank you, and thank you as well, Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Mahoney, um, very much for coming along and, and being such an engaging um responder well, to all these different questions well, so thank, thank you, you for the, thank you for the opportunity one, one thing that, that that came up i think i didn't really um address was this thing that, that about ownership and, and i think with you and your collections it's something probably that you're very very aware of but it, it is the the local indigenous shanghainese people we want really want to give them a sense of ownership about the story of their own history because it's different from the official one the official story and history of Shanghai is, is biased in many, many different ways. Uh, the colonial legacy, the political ideology, all these sorts of things. And that's completely different from the stories which reflect the experiences of the, the ordinary people. And that's what we tried to capture in that one.